In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebrew Jews because the widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on the tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them, and we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, and Icanor, Timon, and Primanus, er, Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. You may be seated. Thank you, Casey. Did good with those words. <laughs> Names. Well, the English language is full of some interesting, what we call anthropomorphic collective nouns. What that means is that's a noun that, that uh, refers to uh, particularly groups of animals. So I, I think a lot of them are very familiar to us, but let's see how well we do, okay? So if I say it's a herd of... <laughs> Buffalo, cows, and I heard elephants, okay? Another one, a herd of sheep, a flock of sheep, right? It's not a herd of sheep, it's a flock of sheep, okay? How about a school, fish? That's pretty much the only ones, I think, that do that. And there is a gaggle of geese. There are some that aren't quite as familiar, but that you might recognize them. It's a pride of lions. A murder of crows or ravens or rooks, any of the black bird family, right? There in that. There is an exaltation. <laughs> you only know because I told you earlier. It's an exaltation of doves. And perhaps because they're so wise, there is a parliament of owls. Well, if you know this, just hold off for a minute. Consider the baboons. They're the loudest, they're the most obnoxious, the aggressive, least intelligent of all primates. And they are a congress. You know, that really answers a lot of questions I've been having lately. And I understand, for those of you who are purists, I know that these are not baboons. These are chimpanzees. But the picture fit better, right? So the, it is a congress of baboons. You know, we as Americans love to take pot shots at our leaders from time to time. And, and understand, there are times when it is totally justified. But, you know, it, it helps us when we can laugh at ourselves, with ourselves, with each other sometimes. But the problem develops, the problem develops when people begin to blame leadership for their own choices and mistakes. Right? That happens a lot, not just in our country, but it happens all over. You see, we take ourselves so seriously sometimes. But the truth be known, um, when we do that, we are embracing what is known as the Geraldine Manifesto. You've heard this before, right? Geraldine Manifesto. How many people remember a comedian named Flip Wilson? from a thousand years ago, right? Flip Wilson played a character whose name was Geraldine. And Geraldine constantly got herself in trouble and her excuse was always, the devil made me do it. Yeah, you got it, right. Um, truth be known, this kind of rationalization has been around for a long time. I mean a long, long time. You could say it's something in our genes. We inherit it from our parents, not just our earthly parents here, but our first, very first parents. I mean, think all the way back in the beginning, the two that were there, Adam and Eve, they were in the garden. The devil came, the devil tempted. And when they were asked why they did it, their excuse was, Geraldine just borrowed it from the book of Genesis. Isn't it amazing how many things are found in the Bible? Listen to me, the devil tempted 
And he still tempts today. But he can't make you do anything. Did you know that? He can't make you do anything. When we blame others for our own choices and mistakes, um, it really doesn't work out. Geraldine was funny, but 98% of the time, the only one who deserves the blame is ourselves. So here, here's the point. I'm going to take the leap, and you can, you can hopefully follow. Our story started out with an incredible positive statement. In the very first verse, the church was growing. I mean, the church was growing. It, it was doing incredible things. After the day of Pentecost, some incredible things happened in kingdom growth. But did you know whenever the church starts growing, whenever we start doing well, whenever we start moving forward the way we should, the devil doesn't like it. The devil doesn't like it. He's going to do everything he can to prevent the kingdom growth. So the first part of the verse says, incredible growth, the church was growing, the church was increasing, and then right in the second half of the same verse, there was conflict. There was conflict. Whenever the church is growing and doing well, Satan is going to do his best to attack the church. Listen to me, folks. This place isn't the church. What we're doing isn't church. We're the church. He's going to attack us, both individually and collectively. I know there's a lot of you that have been going through some struggles in your personal lives. You're the church, and we hurt with you when that happens. Satan doesn't like it whenever the church does well. The church was growing. Miracles happened. People were being saved every day, and he couldn't stand it. His tactics have become refined during the years, but he really has two main forms of attack, fear and confusion. They take many forms. They, the purpose is to create disorder in our personal lives in the church. That's exactly what he was doing here. There was fear because there was no food. It resulted in confusion and hurt feelings. And if allowed to, it could have split the church, the Jews on one side and the Gentiles on the other. Isn't it amazing how things repeat themselves in history? So often we think that what's going on in our country is something brand new. But conflict between races and cultures has gone on since the beginning of there being races and cultures. This isn't anything new. Satan works overtime to create hurt feelings and anger. And his goal back then is the same goal as today, is to make us powerless to win our world to Christ. Isn't that what happens when, when there's fear and confusion and, and disorder and, and things start getting out of, out of line? The church is powerless. Because we're powerless. Satan is tricky, but he's powerless to get us out of focus for more than one minute unless we let him. So our text, as it continues, showed godly wisdom on the part of the leaders. They got the body together, brought the church together, and found the God-inspired solution. And on this day, the very first church board, task force, or committee was formed. And the church has never been the same since. <laughs> But they showed the scripture some godly principles for addressing the needs and effectively ministering within the church life. Lord, this is Satan. It's tricky, but he's powerless to harm us, get us out of focus for more than a minute unless we let him. The first thing they did was identify the need. I perhaps have told you about a pastor that I worked with many years ago. He was, a, he was a good man. He was a compassionate man. He's gone home to be with Jesus now. But let's say when it came down to things like home improvement and mechanical stuff, let's just say he shouldn't. You know the type? I, I still remember one day, since I had a little bit of mechanical ability, he was having a, his, uh, some trouble with his motor home. It was making a funny noise. And so this was his style of auto mechanics. He went to the toolbox and he took out a hammer and he crawled under the motor home and he started banging around and he started it up and it still made that funny noise. So he came out from under the motor home and he got a bigger hammer and he went back. And then there was the time that his uh, mirror was messed up. It, was, it needed to be adjusted on the side of the motor home. Um, he went to the toolbox. Did he get the screwdriver? No. Did he get the pliers? No. Did he get the wrench? He got the... And later that day, I put on a new mirror for him on the motorhome. And then there's the time with the garage. <laughs> anyway, here's the point. There are many times that we have a need, 
And sometimes we can even identify what the problem is, but far too often we go straight to the hammer, so to speak. Does that make sense? This is a pretty important message. Do you, do you get this? You see, a loose screw needs a screwdriver. Well, it depends on what kind of loose screw you're talking about. But yes, a loose screw needs a screwdriver. Fine, that's common sense, but far too often we do it wrong, and the result is always frustration. Well, in our story, in the scripture, there was a need. And they started to work together to find what was causing the problem, and they didn't do it alone. They called the whole community together. It was a church thing. It wasn't just uh, the leaders going, Let, let's just uh, dictate what needs to happen. They called the entire church together, and they found the God-inspired solution. Um, I, I know I've told you this before, too, but that's much the way our church board works. Many of you don't understand that we give very serious consideration to finding godly solutions to all of the issues in the church. I mean, we begin with prayer. We end with prayer. And I can't tell you how many times during the middle of the board meetings I hear prayer, like, God, give me strength, or things like that. Lord, help me not to, yeah. Every dime is accounted for. Our goal, listen to me, this is from your church board and all of us in leadership. Our desire is not to figure out what it is that we want to do. Our desire is to figure out what God wants us to do and then figure out how, how to make that happen. I, I say this a lot, but it's, it's so important. So often we say, God, would you do what I'm blessing? Or would you bless what I'm doing? <laughs> when it should be the other way around. Lord, let us do what you're blessing. Please tell us what it is that you want to, be, to bless. Well, in today's story, they realize, as Moses' father-in-law Jethro told him, that you can't do it all yourself. They couldn't do it. So they got the church together, and they came up with a God-inspired solution. And um, it's interesting. Um, it pleased the whole group. Do you know how hard it is to please the whole group? There's always one, right? Right? There's always one, and they please the whole group. It was the God-inspired solution. See, God doesn't intend for ministry to only be done by those in charge. Ministry is what the church is all about. And all of us, young or old, experienced, inexperienced, are called by God, and this is point number two, to partnership in ministry. Partnership in ministry. You know, isn't it amazing how often when there's a problem in the, in, in the church and in any kind of organization, what's the first thing they do? Well, let's form a committee. And isn't it amazing how we have allowed that? Because, I mean, that's what our government seems to do all the time. They see a problem, they see a, a situation, and they form a committee, and they spend millions of dollars and come up with no solutions whatsoever. I am so glad that God didn't do it that way. He didn't say, look at this creation that I did. What a mess it is. I think I'll form a committee to figure out how to fix it. He didn't do that. God didn't. We must realize that the church, this church is about ministry. We all are about what God wants for us to do. We're looking for what God wants to accomplish in Moscow, Idaho in this year, 2020. They didn't form a committee, but they commissioned faithful men to partnership in ministry. It was a good idea, and it pleased the group. Um, the key to, is this. They obeyed. When we see the God-inspired solution, there's only one option to obey. You see, God is calling men and women today um, to step out of their pews and into service for him. Far often, we're, too, we're comfortable where we are and miss a whole incredible chapter in our lives because we just won't do it. Folks, I can't tell you the number of times when people have come back to me later and said, you know, Pastor, God was calling me to do that. God told me to do that, and I just didn't pay attention. I just didn't listen. Listen to me. When you find the place of obedience to what God, God calls you to do, and I'm not talking just in the church. I'm talking in your life. It's an incredible place to be. And that's why when, in talking to KJ, I... We've had this conversation many times, and he feels God, and we've, we've witnessed God's call in his life to ministry. And I've said, Kevin, if you can do anything else, do it. 
But if God won't let you go, if he won't release you from it, then you do it. Because I tell you, if you're doing something you hate, you'll never be happy. They say if you do what you love for your work, you'll never work a day in your life. It it doesn't mean there won't be some ups and downs, but God will never take you where he can't keep you. See, we get it wrong often. We say it's the pastor's job. Did you know that sheep produce sheep and not shepherds? I mean, that, that should be common sense, but, but do we really feel that way? How often do we say in the church, well, pastor, it's your job to call, to teach, to preach, to disciple, to administer, to pray, to invite, to work in the kitchen, to go to events, to pull the weeds, to cut down the trees with Gordon's help, to, to, to read my mind, to keep me happy, to cater to my needs, to win my family, to take the blame. Do you understand what I'm saying? There are certain pastoral duties But ministry will only happen in the church when we do it together. And God will never ask you, and I know I've said this, to do anything that he won't empower you to do. God won't ask to know our will. He already does. He wants to know if we're interested in finding his will. Hmm. Satan doesn't like it when church people when God's church finally gets a hold of this. He can't stand it when good things are happening in the church. But recognizing where the attacks are coming from is the first step in victory over it. I know that there's lots of people here. I I know that all of your pastoral families have been fighting some kind of battles, whether it's physical battles or it's emotional or relational or family or whatever. Every single one of us have been attacked. And I know that's true for so many of you. You guys are wading through some deep things. But I I want you to understand that some of that is life, but the attacks come from Satan, and his purpose is to get you out of focus. His purpose is to get you thinking about this so you miss the incredible things that he has in store for us. So here's what I want us to do. Today, we look him in the eye, look him right in the eye and say, no more. You may be pacing around like a roaring lion, but you don't scare us. We are God's church, and we choose obedience. We choose partnership in ministry, so go peddle your baggage somewhere else. Did you know that as God's people, we have that right? L- listen to me, not just that right. We have that obligation to look him in the eye and say, go peddle your baggage somewhere else. See, Satan is powerless. His, fears, his tools are fear and confusion. If he can make you fearful or he confuse you, but he can't hurt you unless you let him. He can tempt you, but he can't make you sin unless you let him. He is powerless in your life except at the places that you allow him. So I give you permission. Those places that you're struggling, look him in the eye and say, no more. Go peddle your baggage somewhere else. We're God's church and we're heading forward. I'm God's man, I'm God's woman, and I am heading forward. And I will not put up with that nonsense. We have that right. And I challenge you to do that. Well, the last thing they did is probably the most important. And I just put it this way. Pray, pray, pray. It says in the scripture that the apostles laid hands on them. I know there are times that we would like to lay hands on people. But in this situation, they were laying hands on. They were praying for them. They were commissioning them. They were, they were saying, we recognize this. God, we recognize it, that you've separated out these men to be a part of this, to, to, to head up this ministry. And so we are praying for your blessing on them. And we're praying really for our obedience as we move forward. You know, there are many people who say they pray. I think there are many people who think they pray. A lot of people who act like they pray. But I don't know that many people that really pray. Uh, Stick with me. I, I, I think we all pray one way. If we get the send button down all the time. But see, prayer is not just intended to be me talking and God listening, although he loves to do that. Prayer is a conversation. Prayer is communication. How often do you take your finger off the sin button and say, okay, God, what, do you, what would you like to say to me? 
I guarantee you, if you will do that, if you will develop that habit, God will speak to you, whether through your word or through song or through music or through a, a sermon, a Sunday school lesson, or just a friend. God will speak if you're interested in hearing. God's will for you is, is not hidden or he doesn't intend it to be, but sometimes we have to work at it a bit to find it. We have to get into a place where we're receptive enough to hear his voice. I said it before, I'll say it a hundred times, I'll say it a thousand times before I die. We fight and win the battles of life on our knees, right? You guys, I, I, I figured out where that's from, right? It's from that old Petra song, fight like a man and get on your knees. We fight and win the battles on our knees. An old Steve Camp song, Run to the Battle, it says his armies are marching on their knees. That is where we fight and win. When you have a problem with a person or with a situation, when you need answers, when you're struggling, I guarantee if you spend the time praying, you'll find your answers. Can you remember the time when Holy Spirit convicted you and you realized that you were not living like you should, you were not in right relationship with your Father? The Holy Spirit drew you and you came to that place where you knelt at those altars and you prayed and you gave your heart to Jesus and, and the load was lifted and, and life was amazing. Folks, that's where God wants you to live in prayer. We look back with, with, so, with, with excitement at those memories, but God wants us to live there. We can live there if we continue to let the relationship grow and mature the way he wants it to. See, God wants to fill you. He wants to shake you. He wants to give you peace. He wants to give you strength. He'll give you power to defeat all the attacks of the evil one. Prayer is the key to victory in the Christian life. I didn't say that strong enough to get an amen. Prayer is the key to victory in the Christian life. Amen. amen. I know that reading the Bible is important. I know that worship is important. But prayer is where we connect with our God. Prayer is where we connect. We pray to get in. We pray to stay in. We pray to bring others in. We pray to grow. We pray, 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 or we will stray. See, Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Early church prayed. Paul prayed. Peter prayed. God tells us the prayer of a righteous man is mighty and powerful. And he says whatever we agree on in prayer will be done. You haven't figured it out yet. The essential thing is that we pray. Well, as we looked at our scripture, the first thing we noticed that there was this uh, story of incredible success. People were coming to know the Lord. They were growing in their faith. Incredible things were happening. And then they had the problem and they identified it. After they identified the problem and found the God-inspired solution, the results were immediate. At the end of, the, of that passage, it said, so the word of God spread the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and large numbers of priests became obedient to the faith. Satan was working to destroy God's community and it backfired. You see, those who are truly God's will never do what it is that Satan wants us to do, which is quit and run away. We will never do that. We will keep moving forward, keep striving forward, to accomplish what God wants, it, wants for us. God has a plan for us today, just as he did the early church. Partnership in ministry, undergirded and supported in prayer. It's an unbelievable combination if we'll do it. God is looking for a few good men and women who will commit themselves to his church. Men and women who will realize that regardless of what Satan does, how emotions pull us, no matter what happens. He's on the throne and we are his church. Today, is, for some, it's time to get out of your pew and step up to the line and realize that God is calling you, yeah, you, to the next level of commitment in your relationship 
with him. You've seen this kind of thing before. It would, wouldn't it be cool if God would really do this for us? If he would just call us on the phone sometimes? Would we believe it? I think he could probably tell us something and make it pretty clear that he is God. God wants us. This is not the conclusion, but the continuation of discovering our gifts and our, and our talents and our abilities and our heart's desire. The, the purpose of that is so that we would get involved in ministry in the church. God created the church, and I, he has provided everything that we need within our church body so that we can accomplish what it is that he wants us to do. And here's the deal. As we move into this, this I don't really like the term, but you'll understand what I mean, the new normal that we're living in now, man, we have to evaluate what it is that needs to happen so that we can be effective in 2020 in the midst of and then post-coronavirus and, and, and post all the other stuff that's going on. What is it that God wants us to do? How can we become the, the church that radically transforms Moscow in this area? You know we can. You know how you do it? The same way they did. One person at a time. One person at a time. My prayer is that God would lay on your heart someone. I'm going to pray even, even harder. I'm going to pray this way. God, make it so obvious that we can't miss it. I'm kind of oblivious sometimes, okay, you know? You know, it's like that bird that hits the windshield. <laughs> I'm praying that it'll be that obvious to you that God will bring that kind of circumstance and situation into your life where you just know this is it. Whether it's a place of ministry or a person to minister to or, or a direction or a plan or, or whatever it is. And it will be so absolutely clear that we can't miss it. That's the way to go, right? Right? you bow your heads with me? Father, thank you for your simple word today. And I pray as we move into a time of sharing the Lord's Supper together and, and some more worship and prayer that, that you would just have your way. Speak to our hearts. Draw us to you. Help us to hear your voice. Help us to see your face. And without question to know that you are leading and guiding us. I pray blessings upon each one. In Jesus' name, amen. In just a moment, the praise team is going to come. And um, uh, we're going to share in communion. Hopefully you've gotten one of these communion cups. These are, are very... Um, I, I was asked to give a tutorial. They're not that hard. The top is a, has a wafer, and you can pull this little thin plastic and get to the wafer, and then you can pull the other part to get to the juice. Hopefully you can do that, and if all of that fails, just put it on the floor and step on it, and everything comes out. Please, please don't do that. I, I'm kidding someone, because we found out that it does open when you step on it. So, so we're going to sing some song together, sing a song together, and then we're going to share communion. So if you pull that little top piece, you can get the wafer out. If you don't have communion elements and you would like them, there are some on the table in the foyer. So as we're singing, I would encourage you to, to go and grab those. Okay.